Afrobeat, like religion and Limerick. There's a gladiatorial connotation to it. It's, it's, it's a substitute for war. Monster is home. Jeanette still brings a tear to their eye when, when they put the jersey on and walk out into that pitch and, and the crowd get behind you, the, the hair stand on your neck. The noise is fantastic. This, this, this game is no, is no different than, than, than a family or a life. times when you know your your career might be over and you might have no job next year and you I mean I remember running out for Munster in Ravenhill and you know, thinking if I don't play well here I'm finished. Whenever you put on the jersey and walk out into that pitch and, and the crowd get behind you, the, the hair stand on your neck and I think it's a very special place to be. Munster is home, so that's when you're putting on the red jersey, that's, that's, you're representing your home and, and you're representing the people closest to you, your family and your friends around you. The anticipation and the, the atmosphere there really lifts you and, and uh, it's almost like a cloud underneath your feet, you know, uh, carrying you along. There's a huge respect for, for things that have gone before you, and it's hard to take for granted. You see guys that have been there 10, 12 years, and you know, it still brings a tear to their eye when, when they put their jersey on and, and line up to, to turn out. Tolman Park is when, you know, it was maybe open to only about 12,000 people. The atmosphere was still unbelievable. running out, uh, you, you look across to, to the west stand and, and you kind of know as you're coming out the tunnel what type of atmosphere you're going to be in. She played for Shannon since under 10s, um, something my, my father had uh, always wanted me to do. And I just remember my first training session uh, underage there on a muddy back pitch in the old Thomond Park. I've played rugby since uh, for the last 18 years basically. Um, it's something that has been involved with my family right through, um, particularly from my father's side of things. Well, I had an uncle who played, I had a cousin who played. And so from my point of view, it was probably easier to, to play the game or get into the game because of connection with, with my uncles and my cousins and things like that, Paddy Reid, uh, Brendan O'Brien, and uh, going back. My father played with Shannon and that was his club and it's kind of handed down to you that that's your club and that's the way it used to be again. Um, you know, that tradition to a certain amount has re remained pretty strong around Limerick. Axel's father. Wouldn't, wouldn't have any connection with, with rugby in, in that respect, you know. And he came in, so it was harder from somebody like him. So I have the height of respect from people like that who come into a game who, who haven't had a, a cushion coming into it. He obviously had a love affair with rugby and, you know, it was something that was passed down to myself and my two sisters. And, you know, that's, that's obviously the way it works. I went to art school reach, so rugby was kind of big then. Um, so I went to school and I played 14s junior cup and that. Uh, it kind of took off from there of um, family involved in Old Crescent. Went on to play with Shannon and lucky enough to play at my province and uh, my country under, at underage level a number of times. And I um, had a bad car crash then about, when I was about 26 or 7 to kind of finish my playing. Well, I'm afraid it wasn't the most traditional of routes into rugby in Limerick City. My dad is from Donegal and played minor and senior Gaelic football with Donegal. I played uh, soccer. I used to refuse to play rugby at home. I don't know. Uh, at home, um, like it was always a big thing in my house, but for some reason I never really wanted to play. It was, I remember my little brother still jokes at me now uh, that 
when we went up to Old Crescent, like as under tens, whatever, he might have been six or seven. He was going out playing with them, and I was refusing to sit in the car, you know. So my older brother Brian was the first Toland to be in Old Crescent, and then three years later I joined. I was about eleven, um, and my brother Richard and Henry were actually playing for the club at the time. We had a good underage system there, and I went along and, and really enjoyed it. My dad was president of presentation on Richard, so he brought me out, and I started playing with them with all all of my father's mates, all their sons, they were all brought out there, so we all played underage there up until about 13. My father was a big Gary Owen man, he used to bring me to the games and all the, the senior players um, playing on those teams like the likes of, of Keith Wood and Dan Larkin, Ian Barry, all, all um, excellent players with, with Gary Owen growing up through the, the, I think it was the, the early 90s or so, they would have been my, I suppose, heroes. I think coming from in the underage level, they, they expected that I suppose a, a hero of sorts had gone before me, um, so I'm to fill his footsteps. Um, just, I suppose, I've played for Munster once and I'm, I'm happy that I've won, I've won the jersey. He is playing well at the moment, yeah, he's playing well at the moment. And um, early on, he, he broke a collarbone earlier on and he broke something else and then he went out of the country for a while. And, so it just didn't happen. These things, you know, the, the, these, things, these things happen. I think he's okay, he's my son, I have a lot of time for him. I think I've often joked that if I scored, you know, a try over my own goal line, he'd find some positive out of it. You know, he's always been very, very supportive, and uh, as of all my brothers and, and my mother at home, you know, um, I've been lucky in that. You know, they've um, no, he's always been really good. Like he would have had me out throwing balls around when I was younger with one hand and that kind of stuff, but not not in a kind of get out there and play. Like he let left me do whatever I want. Um, really, really did, you know. They rarely criticise, thank God. I suppose there's enough people doing that. Um, but, you know, they, they will give me a bit of help or they will um, usually talk to me in, in a positive sense. And, uh, you know, I, I really um, am appreciated of that because, as I said, growing up, they were, they were my heroes. From a Limerick point of view, a lot of the guys in the game, traditionally, came from a working class. The fact that they were seemingly harder because they were physically physical workers, they worked in the docks, they worked in the, in the, in the building, that has been replaced now by the um, gyms and the fitness instructors and all that type of thing. But Limerick was one of the, was the third most important port to the British Empire at one stage. So there was a huge English influence here and rugby was one of the biggest influences and they left that to us. So the guys, rather than revolt against it, played the game. Limerick City is unique in a sporting sense because it has, well, for, for example, I played every sport growing up, every field sport available to me, soccer, hurling, rugby, Gaelic football, any field game at all, and all kids in all the communities tend to do that, which is unique in a way, um, certainly different from what a rugby player in Dublin might be coming through. When I moved from Connacht to Munster, uh, it was a massive culture shock in, in terms of walking the streets and people have all the gear and, and the support that we get. Uh, my first year here, we won the Heineken Cup in, in Cardiff, and the amount of travelling support, uh, not only at the final, but uh, the weeks leading up in semi-finals, quarter-finals, other Heineken Cup matches. It, it's immense. We're one of the working class clubs in, in, the, in the city of Limerick and kind of a, an underdog kind of club that have, have, have always done very well. And, um, um, it's hard to say how, you'd, how, how I'd describe it really, um, obviously I'm very proud of the club. My dad, both my older brothers and myself and my younger brother all played for Crescent, you know, and uh, so just growing up supporting them would have been the big thing. Witnessed some, some very big occasions there that obviously, you know, I still remember and they were, they were great to watch my brothers playing in those games. And having come to all Crescent, you're set in an identity straight away. When you put that jersey on, even at under 12s, I remember when I played against Gary Owen or played against Thomond or played against St Mary's, I always felt they were different from me because they were in a different jersey.
I, I would see it as a, it's a very progressive club. They have a, an academy there, which is you know one of the first club academies in in Ireland, and um, they spent a lot of money in, on on developing that, and a lot of time and a lot of a lot of effort went into it. They have a three G pitch there, which is you know they're very progressive in that sense, and and they're getting the um, the best they can for the players and for the club. <laughs> In my time in Shannon, that we had a very strong core of uh, quality players, and you know we we weren't all Limerick lads. We came from all around Tipperary, Clare, with a few down from uh, Port Leash, and another couple from Dublin. You know, so you know there was a I don't know it was just an easy club for me to join and easy people to get along with. When you eventually come into the red jersey, which is the ultimate one, um, you already have been given a foundation of maybe eight years or ten years getting to that. I was probably, I think I was maybe 20, and uh, I ended up having a contract, and uh, it was just amazing at the time. You know, you're, you were getting a car and you were getting, you were getting money, and uh, it was all a bit too easy, I think. And it took me a couple of years to actually um, attune to the life and, of being a professional. When professions came in '95, we were as about as amateur as you possibly could be. Certainly, times have changed a lot, and, and the attitude to, to rugby and being professional in rugby has, has really changed. And uh, it, it did take maybe you know five, six years for for, for it to settle down and, and people to know what works, what doesn't work. And that's a key difference now between kids coming out at 15, 16, 17. If their ambition is to play pro rugby, they understand that there is a massive set of sacrifices that need to be made in order to achieve that, and that's under the professional banner. You know, often hear people talking about all the skills involved in rugby, like kicking, pass and tackling. Like, I do believe genuinely that rolling with the punches a little bit is a huge skill as well. You know, hanging in there is a skill even, you know, because sometimes that, that's what you have to do. Losing the contract was a big shock to the system. I had to leave my hometown of Brisbane and, and go to Sydney and have a job and, and play club rugby. So uh, it's certainly something that uh, gives you a, a kick in the backside. A lot of guys will drop out if they feel the competition is too good. They might have foolish expectations of making it. You need to be you know, um, in the right schools for a start, um, coming through the right setup at under 19, under 20, provincial level, to even get a get a sniff of the academies or sub academies. I think there is out there at this stage. Um, and if you're not in that bracket at that stage, you've little or no chance really. We've well, got a lot of guys here who are aspiring to uh, to fulfil a, a full-time rugby career, um, and they're you know they're training. They're 19, 20, 21 years of age, <clears throat> and then the other side of it, there's guys who have who have done a bit of that, uh, who didn't quite make it, and, and there's all everyone has their different story. You just keep applying yourself, and it's it's not going to come easily. You know that's why I suppose a lot of people end up end up not getting there. You know, and you have to have a bit of luck as well. You know, um, people pick up injuries or part and parcel of it and get setbacks. But you just have to keep training hard and keep knuckling down. That's that's the basis of it. It's just hard work and just staying honest with your training. Well, fairness to Jerry, he went the long way around it. You know, and his drive and uh, to to become a full time to actually make it. Uh, you just can't give the guy enough credit and his drive and determination he definitely does have mentally definitely has the, the drive for that. For, for a long time there was uh, getting paid for a job you do for nothing. I suppose now with the rigours of it and what's going on the pressures it, it's now suddenly turned into a job um, you know that fellas, fellas get obviously well paid for but you know, they are, they are in every cent to get. Uh, rugby is, is my job, and I, I, I take it very seriously. I'm professional about it, but, but it, I, I love it as well. So I, I'm very fortunate to be able to, to get paid to play something I love doing. I would have been happy playing amateur if there was no such thing as professional rugby, obviously, yeah. But um, I think you want to play at the top level. Well, that's the way I would have been. So if, if professional rugby was there to be played, 
um, there was an opportunity to play professional rugby and to be paid to, to, to do what you love, absolutely, that's what I want, would have wanted to do. It's a hard slog kind of trying to play amateur and uh, trying to keep a professional angle on it. The amount of time you put in, especially trying to break into a side, is, is almost seven days a week. You'd have a fitness on Monday, you'd have two sessions on a Tuesday and a Thursday. They'd ask you to do weights on a Wednesday, then you'd have um, maybe travelling on a Friday or else Friday would be a rest day. You'd have a match day Saturday and if you weren't involved, you'd have to play again with the seconds. So um, you're always struggling and always putting in a lot of commitment. So from that side, point of view, it's, it's hard to uh, be motivated and push yourself on to try and want to be professional all the time when that kind of is coming against you. I love playing and just the, the, the knocks and the bruises are getting a bit harder to get rid of, you know. Um, like I used, used, would have been a couple of years ago, it would have been okay on Sunday, um, Monday, but now it's taken me Monday, stroke Tuesday to get rid of them, you know. Touch wood, I've been, I've been lucky, you know, it, it, relative to, to other players, certainly. I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, you look at some guys and, and they have very troubled careers and you, you really feel for them, but I did have maybe two years, right, where um, I had a, had a shoulder problem and, and I had an operation and, and then uh, I got an infection in it so it really wiped me out kind of for two years now I came back and little bits and spurts but you're training but you're training on your own and uh, you do feel very lonely and isolated and, and you're not playing games and uh, you kind of you kind of wonder what it's all about. Some, yeah, some of these marks just picked up from studs and stuff but usually you end up healing again at the end of the day so it's, um, it's only a temporary, temporary mark, nothing too serious. I think I've been lucky enough uh, injury-wise. I've, I've had a few, all right. I've uh, had a, osteitis, a groin thing, osteitis pubis, so I, I got that operated on. Um, I tore two thirds of my uh, Achilles tendon. That was probably the worst. Um, so I've that I've been lucky enough. Obviously, a few breaks and that. But we've super physiotherapists there, Mark and John. When the games are a bit more open, there's probably less collisions in them. You know, when the, when the conditions are better. But uh, when the game, when the weather can get bad and conditions slow the game down, it becomes more of a kind of a war of attrition, and it's 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 tough. But you know, this this is why we're why we train hard so that we can adapt to whatever conditions or whatever game is thrown at us. Rugby in general, it's definitely going to pick up knocks and strains every every season. Um, again, it's just important to get into physio and get into keep keep them under control and um, and keep them down. After every game, the next morning we have massages, organised one-on-one -on -one massages and recovery sessions in the pool and, and rehab and resetting in the weights room. I've never broken anything in, in, through rugby, so the worst injury I've had is, is uh, probably a grade three tear in my right AC, which is on the, on the opposite shoulder. And uh, that put me out of action for about five months in total, let's say. And uh, that's basically, I've been lucky, I've been blessed like that, that there's nothing, nothing serious has happened to me. Um, I haven't uh, had any injury that has really put me out of, out of work for any long serious uh, amount of time like that. I could understand why fellas, um, you know, particularly uh, within the current context of Ireland at the moment that uh, their job suddenly becomes more important than um, going to train on a Tuesday and Thursday and committing a weekend to a game. It's a, it's a hard thing for them to do because they obviously love sport. Family and making a bob comes first at times, and you know you always have to have your priorities straight. When we started out, I was I was working bloody almost 24 hours a day, and um, trying to get this off the ground. But uh, now it's kind of steadied out a bit. Uh, we start here at half nine, and uh, keep going till half five. Um, luckily, I can miss some of the traffic that's involved in Limerick, so it's uh, it's easier to get out here out to the airport at, at about half nine time. Um, winter demand is you don't have people coming every day, but uh, Saturdays is usually our, our main day. That sometimes clashes with, um, with, the, with the Saturday games that I'd have. So I'd, I'd look for um, a Sunday work, or else I'd have my, my colleague doing the work on the Saturday to show people the vans. Well, the first, the first year of transition of, of playing full-time rugby, of going playing club rugby, uh, it was quite hard. Um, just not being, uh, just fatigue and getting, getting back into use to it. You know, coming down, finish work at six, and be, be training around half six, seven, ready to go and doing that four or five, four, five, five nights a week.
definitely for the first 12 months I found it very difficult just uh, just again the transition of it but uh, you know it's, uh, you get used to it. And Paul Neville has been a very very important contributor to Irish sport um, he obviously went to Crescent School as well he, went to, he played in Old Crescent initially uh, he then got involved in Gary Owen, uh, which is a, 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 a a very interesting line and then he obviously played in, in Connacht for a number of years and he's come back to Gary Owen and he's been very successful in doing so, he's obviously captained Gary Owen as well, he's been a leader and Gary Owen as an example play and I've always played an excellent brand of rugby so he's been very very important and it's fantastic to see a guy like that come back because the instinct to some pros is you know I've given it a lot and my body is tired, I'm, I'm sick and tired of it and, but someone like Paul I said do you know what I can there's a lot of fun to be had in this game and he's a good example to lots of pros who when they retire to get back into the club and, and complete that circle. You know I'd have friends playing the game at club level that I still you know massively respect the fact that they you know haven't played professional rugby they can go back and they're still as motivated as ever and, and uh, you know to go on and succeed with, with, a, with, with a good club and you know put their own mark on that club I think professional players would, would always relate to that and, uh, and look you know think very highly of people who've managed to do that you know. Paul Neville's a good friend of mine, I thought he was one of the best players I've ever played with, you know. He's a club man. And what he did say to me recently was that, that if the club don't get the same, don't, don't, don't go back to the same kind of uh, competition level that, that was there in the uh, league, fellas like himself wouldn't, wouldn't learn the game because he reckons he came into a Gary Owen side who tried exceptionally hard to beat a very good Shannon side and a very good Conn side when, the, when that AI league was going well and it made a better player of him and consequently made a better man of him. Because the monster, the, the, the monster thing has gone so big now and so commercial, it's gone huge that the, the All Ireland League has uh, has dipped a bit. Fifteen years ago, the AIL and playing for your club was the top level, and probably now provincially um, is the top level. You know, apart from international, playing provincially is the top level. So, um, you know, certainly a little bit of the gloss has gone off the club game. There's no denying that the crowds that were there. Aren't, aren't there commanding audiences of about 20,000 in Gary Owen, you know, for um, for AAL game between Con and, and, and Gary Owen, and the, the atmosphere was brilliant. The, the build up to the, to the game was, was immense, and you know, everyone just wanted to be there. You know, I'd remember going up to Old Crescent watching, you know, guys like Brian Toland or, you know, Liam Toland would have been playing, or Stephen Toohey. The club game would have been the pinnacle in Irish rugby at, at the time, and I suppose. Provincial rugby at the time was only kind of you know four games a year, and the fact that the Limerick clubs did so were so successful at that level in, in the AIL league transferred its it, it, its work onto the Monster team because the Monster team wouldn't be the force it is today only for the AIL league. The club concept, which is a competition and a winner, winning and losing is very very important in it, and I think there's a huge um, a huge building block to take away from a young guy if, if, you, if you put them straight into the academies into what would be deemed somewhat meaningless games. I think the clubs are dying to death and they need the support of the union and I think it's been seen this year, especially down, down, down in Limerick direction, the volume or the number of international players that have needed rugby and the clubs had to be there for them and they were there for them. I don't think that Munster has killed off the club competition, I just think that the emphasis has shifted and I think that it's important that the structures are uh, are carefully looked at so that the club game continues to flourish and that uh, there isn't a drop off and a defeat because that's where Munster are going to draw the majority of their players. The clubs have had a very proactive structure about developing their game within the club. Then Munster came in on top of it uh, and in, in a sense took all that good work but didn't replace it. The AIL was always used before for guys to show themselves and to pursue you know, full-time rugby um, like David Wallace used to play with Gary Owen, Killian Keane, Dominic Crotty, and the likes of Shannon, Hugh McGalway, Eddie Halvey, um, all those guys, right? But now it seems to be a bit more where um, they're just using it as game time. They're, you know, they've got their monster set up and they're, they're using it as a development to come through. It's a bit harder, you know, to, to come through from that stage now. 
the Munster team again going back are building an academy so they're trying to get as many guys into the Munster brand and prepare them for the, the professional game and that can leave clubs aside and certainly where the GAA have a strength is that the club is very much the building block that's a threat for rugby to develop I think you know you, you, you do need the strong provinces but you also need the, the you know the, the feeding system which is the clubs and there's um, a lot of pulling and dragging and a lot of players players jumping ship, jumping clubs and moving on and you, you have to res at times you have to respect that because they're trying to play at the highest level possible for themselves but at times uh, it dilutes, uh, d probably dilutes the club system that used to be in the town. You get the odd one back every here and there but um, which you know which gives you a chance to concentrate on the club players which is where you want to try and bring them through but um, yeah in the space of four or five years it changed utterly. The players get pulled off us. And it's a Thursday night. We're sitting here trying to pick a team to see, you know, for the weekend. So, to make our team for the weekend, we have to wait to see our monster going to use these guys. So they they'll use them, uh, you know, when it suits, suits them, which is the way, obviously, because they're that's their job. The IRFU then have to figure out uh, a mechanism to keep the clubs as the building block of Irish rugby and that's a threat in that because obviously if you're running a professional team you want to have complete ownership and control over the future players. That's beginning to happen now at the detriment of the clubs. Maybe there's too many teams you know, in Limerick to be honest with you to, to bring the levels up to where it needs to be. I don't think so. I think there's still an awful lot of kids uh, coming through the system. If you, if you ask any of the underage coaches there's buckets of kids playing so there is enough there's enough kids to play given the supporting structures given the coaching structures given the funding um, you know to get the players in and to build decent squads and to work hard at the moment it's back to the club to try and do everything just the money isn't there anymore for the clubs to bring players through a good idea maybe to go back to um, come back to just maybe a Munster senior league and trying to get maybe the way it's based in Australia where you'd have Shannon would travel on to Cork on a Saturday and it started off with Shannon thirds playing, then Shannon seconds, Shannon twenties and Shannon firsts would all play on the same day against Con. You can't do that because of uh, the pitches just don't take that kind of punishment, particularly during the winter months. Um, obviously it's, it becomes a very sociable day and a very enjoyable day for players and supporters and family to, to, to hang around then for the day. If you play a match at 9, 10 in the morning, you hang around for the day till the big game at, at 2 or 3 o'clock. But obviously weather and that as well is, is, is a hard thing here. I do believe that that um, maybe an amateur union running in tandem with, with, with the international one would, 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 would be more beneficial to, to the clubs in, to, the, to the heart of the game. So the game will be a better game if both the professional game and the amateur game respect each other equally rather than one telling the other what to do. As the game developed and as the game got more popular, the more newspapers, TV, press got a hold of it and blew it out of proportion so people would actually, actually recognise who and what you were and whatever and they would make comments but in the early days, you know, it would, wouldn't be a case of that because uh, um, you were lucky if uh, you were lucky if a game med TV, but now it's all over the place. And people do, I suppose, notice you more when you're out or when you're in, you know in town or in the street. And um, yeah, I, th I think it goes hand in hand with being a professional, being a role model, and you're just making the right decisions, the right choices, and uh, you know you can't be out every night or, or you know or drinking or things like that. You don't mind being asked autographs, but sometimes it can get a, get a little bit irritating. And most of the time, it's 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 great. You know, it's just sometimes you get people up giving you their opinions, especially when you're out with family and friends. It can be a bit annoying. I say for some of them, it is hard. You know, some of the people who, uh, you know. Um, you know, the media want a lot of attention from and sponsors want a lot of attention from. The amount of, of uh, publicity they've got has been immense, you know, by any standards. Worldwide, they're a worldwide brand, they're a worldwide name. And I'd say a lot of people who are in it, in the professional thing, they said, listen, we've got, to, we've got to make hay where the sun shines. Some guys like to get involved in businesses while they're playing and um, it's something that I would like to do in the future. But for me, it just it takes up a lot of my... Um, a lot, of, a lot of my time, if you're doing an ad or whatever, you, you know, you one day you get in there, you get it done and you get out. It's obviously something that uh, you do in, in that moment, p 
purely on the grounds that if you don't do it, somebody else will, and uh, you probably won't get a chance to do it again. So you, uh, you grasp what you can when you can. Yes, they're conscious that when they retire, the world has now changed. So these guys who retire in the mid-30s, they have to start a whole new career. So they would be silly not to somewhat maximise their earning potential while they can, because they could be very fallow times ahead. I suppose we, we have a short career and it's about um, making money while you're here and it's about building contacts while you're here. Um, so many of the guys that retire from professional sports end up struggling in a life after rugby. Anything that they've, they've actually reaped the benefit in professionalism, best to look to them, they deserve it. One of the unique aspects of it is that our sporting heroes are tangible, they're touchable. You can actually put your hand on Paul O'Connell. You can actually bump into him in this city. Limerick is a small place and pe people tend to know the lads who are, on, who are playing on the Munster team at the time. It's fantastic that the whole province buys into the brand and, and, and the team. Um, and it's great for us you know, to have people interested in what we do, um, that, that you know, through the generations have created that for us. Uh, it's kind of a legacy that uh, for the short time that we get to wear the jersey that that we leave it in you know, as good a standard as, as it's been in the past. And for people to, to come up to you on the street, uh, yeah, it's flattering. It, you know, it's a sense of pride and accomplishment that you're doing a good job. I think Irish rugby sport is more attainable to its community, is more accessible to its community than, than the equivalent maybe in, in the UK. People give so much of their time for this team, supporting them and, and following them all around that when you get a chance to play for them that you've got to produce the goods. If you don't, people, people are going to come up to you and tell you, but we've been fortunate enough that since I've been playing with Munster that our results have in general been, been good, you know, and, and people have been, been very supportive of us. And I suppose the, the measure of it is when, when results have gone against us, people have still, still rallied in behind the team, which I think is, you know, which is the essence of the Munster supporters. A lot of people will obviously analyse this and what is the secret of Munster. I think that is one of the core aspects of the success, that you can actually bump into Jerry Fannery or you can bump into Paul O'Connell and he won't run away. He'll actually stand there and face, face his community as, as a shared group. It's part of the job and it's, you know, I wouldn't change my, wouldn't change my job for the world. I love what I do. And I think what the, the, the Munster supporters give the players is that emotion, that emotion and intelligence to say, look, we're right behind you. It's a fickle crowd. We're right behind you. We want you to win, and we're demanding it of you. So I think it's very, very important. It's a very special relationship that the Munster supporter has with his with his uh, player, and the respect that that the fans give the players, uh, especially the New Zealand guys when they first played us, that was huge for them. They just uh, were really impressed by it, by the supporters, how respectful they were to the other players. It's kind of galling to meet people there that you know won't turn up to see the club game the following day, and I find kind of find that really hard to understand how, if they do love rugby that much, that and they they pay so much to go to France or wherever to watch a monster game, that you know on their return back home on Saturday night after the game, or whatever, that they won't turn take in a club game on Sunday. The monster supporter now isn't necessarily a club supporter. When I played for Munster back in the day, you might have had 500 people watching a Munster Leinster game. And that was it. And those people would have come from clubs. Whereas now you could have 26,000 or up to 50,000 people watching a Munster game. And they don't necessarily come through the club structure. You know, some guys you just have no interest in going to club games. So, you know, you have to wonder what their motive is in, in supporting a, a team. You know, like, like this, is it just follow, a follower or is it a supporter? So, like, I, you know, my, my first allegiance is to the club always. Anyone that's playing rugby aspires to be a professional rugby player, like a foot soccer player or whatever. So uh, you, you don't want it to end, you want to, to prolong it as, lo as long as you can. You know, are there situations in a career where you're worried about more your contract than your and you, who you're playing for, and that does happen. There are times when you know your your career might be over, and you might have no job next year. And you, I mean, I remember running out for Munster in Ravenhill, and you know, thinking if I don't play well here, I'm finished. Like, and that's a different type of pressure, you know. Um, I actually remember driving to the Heineken Cup final and thinking, this isn't pressure. Like, I know what pressure was. The pressure was that day four years ago. Like.
you know those big games are just electric you love playing them they're enjoyable you want to you want to be there you know if the pressure when it really really is on is when you're worried about your your livelihood you know what i mean you're worried about you know everyone who believes in you and, and push you to this point and helps you to get to this point and you're out there playing one more game and you if you don't play well you, you could be finished first and foremost you earn a living from playing rugby and uh you have to go where, where you where you can get contracted um i don't see any reason to ever leave munster at the moment munster is one of the best places you could be i can't you know, it's you're continuing to develop as a player, and, and you have the chance to be successful and to win things every year. And you're playing with a group of your mates, and you know it's, there's good honesty here and there's fantastic support. So it's you obviously have to consider leaving if it comes to that. But I can't see any reason why you would leave unless your hand was forced. Munster had told me, that, you know, the day before that they probably weren't going to have anything for me that year. You know. I remember being very upset and on the phone to my wife now, even telling her that, you know, trying to think about what I'm going to do next year, you know, and like it only lasts for 24 hours, you know, I hadn't ex I hadn't even explored the chance of moving that season, um, and then the, they actually phone rang me, yeah, so it was, it was really a strange coincidence, and um, you know, it would have been hard to leave Munster if 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 there was something there for me as well, you know, so I, to, I mean, even though such a big club wanted me, the fact that there wasn't anything there for me in Munster kind of made my mind up for me anyway so it almost made it easier to go if you know what I mean you know I had nothing to lose obviously I've been lucky to be associated with some great clubs and, and Moss was definitely one of them. Say someone like Owen Redden who has come out of he played in, in Crescent schools played in Old Crescent uh, uh, played in Munster for a bit went on to Connacht went across to England came back to Leinster you can if you asked him where did he learn his competitive spirit where did he learn his his never say die attitude. Like a guy like him has had a difficult journey and has come out every time is an extraordinary achievement. I never moved out of Limerick all my life, so the opportunity came to go to France. And it was literally myself and Sean spoke about it. I'd say for about a week and literally just went over to France and met with my agent in the club and all that and just signed, just said we'd go for it and it was a great experience. If we can produce, keep producing players here who are not making the, 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 the professional area and they're good enough to, to be brought into some some uh, some some professional outfit where they could blossom, where they would get a chance to do it, you'll find that they'll go across the water. Chase your dream wherever it'll take you. I never thought for the life of me I'd be in Ireland um, where I am now, and uh, as a young guy in Australia, so it, it's it's turned out fantastic for me with uh, finding um, the love of my life, my wife, and uh, a couple of kids. So it, it's been fantastic. You, you don't know where the that journey will take you. If you want to compete at Heineken Cup level, which is, you know, the number one prize, I suppose, in a way for the province, you ain't going to do it without, unfortunately, two or three world-class players. Now, they're coming in on big contracts and they say they're going away, but I think we've got good value out of the John Langfords, the Reese Ellisons, the um, Trevor Halsteads. They're contributors to the game, definitely. Now, there were some people who came in who wouldn't have the same work ethic as them. I think bringing in foreign players, you know, is um, something you have to be quite careful with, you know. There's, there's, there's going to be good players and bad players, and. Um, yeah, just re recruiting carefully is important. I think um, specifically Doug Howlett coming in has been, you know, he's one of the top players in world rugby. He is definitely a guy whom you could say to your son or your anybody you want to look, have a look at his commitment, have a look at his, his, his uh, oh no, every one of us, he's not perfect by any means, but anything he does, he does it trying to do the right thing. He's totally honest. And to bring in a player like that is a huge, huge coup for Munster. Um, the, the, the almost best thing was when he, when he came in how quickly he, he bought into the culture of Munster and how quickly he assimilated into what we were doing and uh, he's just he's just a really good professional he's just hard working and, and a really good guy You'd like to think that the younger players will pick up a certain amount that they wouldn't have picked up without meeting these guys you'd like to think that's going to happen uh, Knowledge that, that I can pass on I'd be more than happy to you know, I enjoy seeing uh, guys improve and, uh, and work at things and, and the amateur game, the, there is a big gap between professional and amateur, especially in Ireland and uh, any hints or tips that, that I can give on 
uh, to, to the club I'm working with and be happy to, yeah, I really enjoy it. I was delighted to see Conrad Smith, who was one of the, you know, in the top two or three outside centres in the world. He's a phenomenal player, he plays for the All Blacks, obviously, and he quoted recently that if he was to move out of his environment, he would love to come to Munster. And the reason why he said that was because Munster represented everything that he was connected with, passion, respect, hunger, uh, success, all the key building blocks. Yeah, most of them are gone after, I suppose, three years. So the, if you're working with the 18, 19, 20 year olds, they're, tra they're ready to come through then when they're gone. Whereas the guys that are already 22 or three, yeah, they're stopping them progressing. But obviously they feel they're not going to come through as quick as they'd like. You have to be mindful of the knock-on effect it has to your local players. So if you take Conrad Smith as an example, well, how, how will that affect Keith Earl's development? as an example. He's a, a, a British and Irish Lion, he's an international, and he's not making his side, so that's going to be a detriment. But I think where it's going to be more uh, difficult for coaches is the front row. Straight away a whole new raft of, of uh, Southern Hemisphere players have come in, and they're now picking up those players in the front row. That is going to be a monumental negative effect to Irish rugby, to have the first answer, the checkbook. And I think the amateur ethic is the best method of, 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 of minimising that type of thing. And I, I've, I've, I've straddled both sides of it. If you pick any, any, any good, honest rub, professional rugby player, they're all going to have you know, certain aspects of their game which you know, that are, they're strong on and you can, you can learn from everyone on that, really. It's like, it's like learning a language or learning something else. You'll always find out something about yourself if you're learning something else from somebody else. You feed off so much from them. You know, you look at, 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 at what they do in training. You kind of say, well, you know, that's that's how they're successful. And um, I think I think it it motivates everyone to, to, to want to be like them. So they they have, have the right attitude and are setting the markers and the benchmark, and, and players are going to roam behind that and, and, and try and match it. You talk about guys like Doug Howlett and John, Jean de Villiers that, that we've signed in the last few years, but uh, those two guys are, are consummate professionals and, and uh, I learnt a lot of how they, they work uh, and, and what means a lot to be a good player from them. And uh, I think it's a special place when, when your foreign players add that to, to what you already have in, in experienced internationals. Probably from about the mid-90s back into the 60s, it hasn't changed in 30 years like it has changed every four months, every six months it's constantly changing. It's changed a lot. I think rugby has opened up to a huge wave of people that didn't really follow rugby. Um, you know, I think there's all, you always hear stories about, um, you know, games that were, you know, between Munster and Leinster, when I was involved in Gary Owen, there was maybe only two or three hundred people at the game. Um, and now when you think of that nowadays, it's, it's, you know, it's a far cry from, from, where, from, from the audience that you get there. Like, I suppose it's got more professional and all that kind of stuff. And you've got guys who are, you know, in seventh, eighth year of their professional career now, and they're obviously had a lot stronger than they were when they started. The players now know and understand nutrition, know and understand sleep, know and understand the quality of the game. And one of the big debates in world rugby now is the physical stature of the player. And New Zealand are slimming down slightly, Australia are slimming down slightly. Brian Driscoll did it a few years ago. Paul O'Connell, who's just come through a horrible injury, he's obviously bulked up, but in a way that will meet the challenges that he's going into. Yes, there's a new game, but how can we apply it to the way we want to play it? And is that going to get us through? Is that going to give us success at, at, in the world stage? Melbourne Hemisphere Rugby is definitely catching up, and there used to be a substantial gap uh, in terms of you know, talent and success and, and you know with teams like Ireland in the last few years and, and France at World Cups, you know, they're very competitive. Rugby is, is up on a, on a higher pedestal than it was and, and I suppose players are, are more aware of that now. And it will never be the same, but like everything changes, everything evolves. The last 10 years and, and the bit of success that we've had, it, you know, we always look back to previous Munster teams and and how they played, you know, obviously beating uh, the All Blacks in '78, and and uh, um, you know all the times they you know they beat Australia as well. Um, I was lucky to be to be at, a, at, at one of those games, and uh, you know you, you do definitely think back and uh, the people and the, the players who wore the jersey and, and the pride that they played with the jersey and, and how they filled it, and uh, you really want to to emulate that and, and carry it on. 
and I think um, I think that that's certainly still the case today, and hopefully it will be um, for generations to come. It, it, it's something that I will cherish. Playing for Munster is is a special time in my life. You know, I know it's not going to last forever, unfortunately, but um, anyone that, that gets the chance just loves it. This this, this game is no is no different than, than, than a family or a life that you're living. You know, it's about fulfilling other people's needs rather than just going your own way and forgetting about everybody else.